Thanks, Claire. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak. I will start sharing my screen and I hope that it works. All right. Okay. So I'm going to move on to full screen. Hopefully you can see that. Okay. Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to echo a lot of the things across the various talks you've already seen. I hope that's a, a good thing. I'm going to be presenting the work of a lot of other different people. Um, fortunately, three of them are here on the meeting now, unless they try to escape. Um, so they'll be answer, able to answer some of the more technical questions because they're the ones who really know it. Okay, so I'm going to go through a series of different points, trying to cover the various areas which um, this meeting is supposed to be about. Where did we start off? Where did we learn? Where are we going next? That, that kind of thing. I'm going to start off with a question. Why are people like cows? And here in particular, you saw from my title that I'm a, I work in veterinary epidemiology. One of the big things I tend to work on is bovine tuberculosis in cattle and badgers. And so um, in funding from DEFRA, so this is government funded work, um, we developed a model of bovine tuberculosis, which looked at a 12 million agent simulation, all the cattle in Britain, trying to understand how cattle and badgers interact to spread disease. The model was fit using an approximate Bayesian approach, fairly standard way of doing things. Um, and the result you see here is a result of a model fit over um, a number of years to the middle of, of the uh, epidemic. Okay. Um, a key point over here is because it was a model developed explicitly for policy, a lot of effort was spent to make the development robust. We had two software engineers working in tandem, one developing, the other one testing, using well-established software engineering uh, approaches to model testing. Now, the reason why that's important in this case is it meant that when COVID-19 came around, we were able to very rapidly take that model with good assurance that it was robust and convert it into a model of coronavirus in Scotland, turning herds into what are called output areas, so areas of about 100 to 150 people, livestock movements into commuter movements, regular herd testing into community PCR tests. And a sort of side point to make over here is that one of the sort of interesting effects of lockdown is it actually makes human populations and human affections behave more like livestock ones. So spatial considerations start to matter more. Okay. Now that's not central to the modeling approach we used, but it does some, have some interesting implications in particular to things like the evolution of the virus itself. Okay. So the way that the virus evolves, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, largely because I'm not, not an expert in this area, but it evolves very differently if you have a large number of spatially separate um, epidemics as opposed to something where there's quite a bit of mixing. Okay, so think of something the way flu uh, transmits, how flu evolves. So we can fit the model of the epidemic. Now, this is the very early things that were done uh, in the first wave. Here showing the across all the different local authorities in Scotland, the fit of the model to the number of deaths. And the reason why we're fitting deaths over here is completely taking Graham's point. But at the time, the case reporting was particularly bad. So deaths was probably the thing. And even that was a little bit dodgy, but still more reliable than cases at the time. Okay. So this is a number of deaths per week showing a reasonable fit across the entire epidemic in Scotland, including movements between them. And this represents an element of spatial spread. So the number of data zones, so units of about a thousand people which had a death in them across those areas. That not fitting quite well, but nevertheless, still showing overall about the right pattern. The posterior distributions for the various parameters were fairly tight, fairly good opinions. A key outcome from this is number one, that um, most of the transmission occurred within an individual's local authority. Now, if I should be able to minimize that, that should help there. Um, most of it occurred within a, a local output area. So a lot of transmission is quite local. Of course, that, that um, reflects the fact that a lot of transmission is in local neighborhoods or within the home. The other one is we were able to estimate the increased likelihood of dying fairly early on, showing that in deprived local authorities, uh, you are three point, about three and a half times more likely to die of COVID if you got infected compared to the least deprived area. To dismiss this. You can probably see all that, which you don't really want to do. Um, so that was very early work done. We've been using this model throughout the pandemic. And just to highlight some relatively recent use for this, um, we looked again with the beginning of Omicron at the potential of that to cause more serious problems. This is about 
in early December through to mid-December, when it was very clear that Omicron was spreading much faster than Delta was, but we didn't have a good idea of the extent to which that was because it had um, uh, was better able to escape from prior immunity, so evade vaccination past infection, or was because of an effectively higher transmission rate. And so the work done over here looked at a variety of plausible scenarios based on the information we had from South Africa at the time, evaluated them in the model against what we knew about the early rise. This is that sort of uh, November, December period. And that initial work was um, showed that only the, the worst scenarios that we could see seemed to be plausible, okay? Oh, just as a side here, you'll notice in the corner, uh, in gray, various people's names, that while many people contributed to the various bits of work, that is the individual who is uh, essentially leading that bit. So just to give credit to those individuals, here it's uh, Chris Banks, who is, I believe, on the uh, in the meeting right now. So we use this to try to project forward as to what different um, outcomes would be for different levels of uh, restrictions. And in particular, what we showed along with many, many others was that um, it, it, Omicron had the potential to be very, very bad. But of course, what we know is that it actually kind of fizzled out. Okay, so one of the things that uh, was believed to occur was that uh, voluntary behavioral changes, because the actual restrictions put in place at the time were quite mild, may have led to substantially less amount of interactions, essentially reducing the, the network of contacts that you had, also potentially the amount of transmission, possibly reflecting some of the things that Graham was talking about earlier, but you know can't entirely be sure of that without more investigation. More importantly than that, though, was the fact that in the end, as some of the initial data from uh, South Africa suggested, it turns out that Omicron was substantially less severe. So we already know that. So if we take the um, scenarios over here, which show the increase in cases um, that we were projecting at the time, the reduction in the number going to hospital resulted in much less uh, hospital burdens and therefore much less overall severity. Hospitalizations and deaths being, of course, the things that we most worry about. The data points here are represented by the black dots, the model projections based on the assumption of something like Delta being shown in uh, purple. So this, this, again, is the work of Chris and also Anthony Wood, whose work will come to uh, a, a bit later. Okay, so that represents some of the simulation modeling work that we've been doing. Now, one of the results from doing all of this effort is it results in other questions um, which end up being important in themselves. And again, this is something that um, was mentioned earlier. Um, so the kind of information we have, the most recent information to understand what's going on is the number of cases. Um, but the problem we have with cases is that it represents a biased uh, estimate of the true number of infections. And it's the true number of infections that are occurring that we miss, wish to model. And in order to try to understand the relationship between what we call uh, the case ascertainment ratio, so the relationship between observed cases, the ones that are reported, and the actual number of infections, what we did is looked at two key data streams. First of all, the, the ONS surveillance, uh, which looks at the overall prevalence of disease, and then the community testing, which represents essentially mainly people with symptomatic results, but also, also some others. Now, if you compare these two, and this is a relatively early uh, bit of data, you can compare the instance of cases over time on the upper left, and then the lower left, you have the um, overall ascertainment of the number of people with infections from the surveillance data. And what we want to do is we want to understand the relationship between the two of them. Now, to do that, you can use two pieces of information. One is, is effectively, how long is it? What is the distribution of times over which an individual um, takes to become symptomatic? And then if you imagine doing the surveillance uh, with the PCR test, what is the probability of testing positive if you were in fact infected over time under that random uh, surveillance system? Now, with a bit of careful bookkeeping and a bit of maths, you can therefore compare those two things, the instance, so how fast those infections are being picked up through community testing, to that prevalence estimate. And you can relate them through what um, 
uh, Ewan Coleman, who was the person mainly responsible for this, I was calling case ascertainment. So what is the probability that if you have an infection, that you then go on to be tested and to test positive. And what you can see is that if you look across the different regions across Great Britain, um, and you look at over time, there are substantial differences in what that case ascertainment appears to be. Um, on the left are, are the curves over the initial work that was done um, following the, the preprint, which uh, here's the reference at the bottom right. This is the more recent data. And what you can see over here is in particular, after a confirmatory PCR tests were no longer necessary, there's a substantial drop off in that case ascertainment. Certainly our estimates are, are that it, there's a substantial draw off. But interestingly, that Scotland in particular seems to have a much higher case ascertainment rate, perhaps partially helping to explain why there seems to be so much infection in Scotland at the moment. If we then look across ages, what we see is a consistent differences in ascertainment, no matter what the underlying variant was. So here looking at the initial phase of wild type, then looking at alpha and then at delta, and they show broadly speaking the same patterns that ascertainment increases with age. But if you look across the different variants, there are considerable differences in how the different regions behave. Now you have to be a little bit careful because obviously the variants are um, occurring at different times different um, restrictions, different uh, across different nations, certainly, but also different attitudes towards testing may have an effect in different segments of society that are that are dealing with things. So it's not necessary that these ascertainment differences are due to the variant. They're simply associated with when that variant was prevalent. So here we see one way in which looking at things regionally really does matter. Another way of looking at it is to look at the estimates of the R number. So this in particular is looking at over the um, period of Omicron dominance. And here comparing the R number that you see for ones that in the PCR test you would call SG negative. So this is indicative of the first Omicron variant. Otherwise, S gene positive, initially indicative of probably the Delta variant, later on probably the second uh, BA2 lineage of the Omicron variant, which has become more dominant recently. And what you see here are estimates across some example local authorities in Scotland. Um, I'm not gonna go into the methods here, uh, just for purposes of time. They are similar to some of the other ones that, that have been mentioned before. Um, and you see over time here, starting from the beginning, that initially there's a vast rapid increase in the first Omicron variant, consistent with what we saw in December, a decline here, and then this rise over here as the second Omicron variant uh, appears to rise and becomes more dominant. But the thing I wanna draw your attention to is this cloud of points which represent the, the um, estimates for the R number across the different local authorities. So quite a bit of variation across all, all of them. And so the question is, can we can we do something to try to understand what is driving those differences? And we're quite fortunate in that we have for COVID-19 quite a wide variety of data to help us to understand this. So it has got to be by far the most well-recorded uh, infectious disease uh, of humans that we have ever seen. Enormous information about um, the infection itself, both the outcomes of infection, but also a lot of the information that we collect either through standard government surveys or through things specifically done for COVID-19 um, to tell us about the underlying demographics of the population and how they move about. And as an example, to show us um, how you, you might just visualize some of this information, um, we again are fortunate to have information in this case about um, highly localized um, rates for cases, um, hospitalizations, down to what are called data zones, which I mentioned before are areas of about a thousand individuals. So what we have over here are all the data zones in Scotland ranked from the one that is least deprived through to the one that is most deprived. And these wiggly lines that you see going across here represent quartiles of the number of cases. And the way you want to interpret this is the more close together two lines are, the greater the concentration there are of cases in those two areas. Okay? The fact that cases are relatively evenly distributed 
says that, that there's a widespread, typically, distribution of cases, no matter what the deprivation is. There are some changes in that over time, okay? But broadly speaking, it's fairly evenly divided. Now, you have to be a little bit careful about that, okay? Because if you look, start to look at this in more detail, and this represents now a more recent um, data. So this is from one of the more recent periods. Um, here, looking at distribution of lateral flow tests and PCR tests across different age groups and across different deprivation deciles. So this represents the number of uh, lateral flow tests and PCR tests taken on the left in the middle of the number of positives and the right, the positivity, so the proportion of them that are positive. And what you can see is in this period, more recently, when um, confirmatory PCR tests have not been necessary, the fewest recorded cases appear to be the ones with the highest levels of deprivation and in the younger age groups. But in contrast, those very groups have the highest pos positivity. And what they suggest, of course, that there's some element of case um, ascertainment, which is lower over there. Now, of course, what we don't know is whether people are taking tests but not reporting them. And we certainly have speculated on things like whether or not if you're having to take tests regularly for work, which might be occurring if you're in a job where physical distancing is relatively difficult to do and so you're required to do it all the time, you may be less inclined to report every single test than if you're just doing it um, for purposes of, you know, going out to visit family or something like that. We don't actually know what the answer is, um, but understanding the difference between do those two things, are people testing and not reporting if it's negative, or are people not testing, actually is really important. Okay. Be that as it may, if you look at more severe outcomes, which we would expect to be more regularly reported, what you see is quite a different pattern. Ignoring the uh, data at the very end when there's um, almost certainly some missing data, what you see is an increasing concentration of more severe outcomes to the more deprived data zones. Okay, so evidence that there are quite substantial differences in the way you need to look at uh, those more severe outcomes. And again, whether there are simply that that it's um, a lack of information about the cases or that things have uh, more severe outcomes if you're in those more deprived areas, we don't know the level to which those two types of explanations may be important. Okay. Um, now, with that kind of detailed data, we can also look at things spatially. And here, just looking at, for example, the uptake of vaccination across data zones, what you can see, and this is a point about in mid-November, before Omicron had taken off and um, when boosters were being rolled out, is a substantial difference in the uptake of vaccination across the different data zones in Scotland. These enormous data zones, of course, are in the Highland, where the number of people are relatively low, much smaller data zones in Edinburgh, but very distinct patterns. Over here, uh, this area uh, in the central area of Edinburgh with obviously lower uh, amount of uh, uptake. Here in the rural areas, the same kind of thing. And what we want to do is we want to try to understand what is driving those differences. So we, what we, our aim in this case is to try to use all those bits of data that we have to say what is it that represents the different characters of these zones. Now the problem that we have, of course, is we have enormous information about things that we already had an idea were, were important. So things about deprivation, about ethnicity, um, about access in particular being one of them with regards to those rural areas, but an awful lot of those factors are highly correlated. Okay, so one of the problems with trying to understand the roles of different elements of deprivation is that if you have, for example, high levels of alcohol use, there is almost certainly going to be a high level of drug use as well. If you have issues with regards to attendance in schools, you also have lower rates of university um, uh, people going to university. So trying to pull them together with standard statistical models um, is at the very least difficult. Um, so the approach that we use, and this again is the work of Anthony Wood um, working on, on this particular data set, is to use a, a fairly standard machine learning approach called random forest models, which are specifically designed, among other things, to deal with one noisy data, but also to limit the fact of these correlations. 
okay? So avoiding overfitting the data in particular when there's potentially a lot of noise and trying to understand things in the presence of all these correlations. Um, and what you can see is that in the best fit random model, uh, random forest model, and I'm not going to go into details a bit, let's go, go a bit more into uh, the details of the model for the Omicron variant spread itself. Um, what you show is, broadly speaking, um, a, a pretty good fit of the model, actually. I mean, this doesn't highlight that, but I just wanted to highlight here that what you also see is quite a bit of difference in the ability of the model fit across different areas. And the reason I wanted to show this was because it showed what I think is a relatively important point, which is one of the reasons when, one of the things when you know you have what we would call enough data to understand something is when you see clustering of phenomena that you want to understand. So broadly speaking, what you want to have is data that is more resolved than the problems that you've got. And over here, what this suggests is this clustering of uh, difficulties with model gives us something that we can latch on to to try to understand better. Okay, when that doesn't happen, when things appear more homogeneously mixed, then it means that your data resolution isn't as good as you would like. And so this suggests it's, it's good enough for what we want to do. Now, that was an example for the uh, vaccines. And uh, the reason I wanted to highlight that in particular is because we've been feeding that to the Scottish government on a weekly basis. And they've been taking it to the individual health boards to help them to understand better where they need to target further vaccine uptake. And we've been doing that for, for certainly for several months. Um, you can also fit the same kind of model to try to understand <clears throat> excuse me, the spread uh, of the, the virus itself. Here looking in particular at the early spread of Omicron and what you can see if you compare the data to the model that we have, um, you get a pretty good fit across age, across um, deprivation deciles and between the two genders. <coughs> excuse me. If however you now look at the same thing spatially, again, you get some of the same issues with regards to variation. And um, in the work that Antti's been doing since that initial graph, there have been some things he's done to explain it a bit better. Um, there's many possible reasons though why these things may exist. There's census issues, possibility of behavioral patterns, which of course we can't, um, can't avoid uh, and can't explain. There also may be differences, as I noted before, between epidemiological risk and ascertainment deficits. So are people record, not recording or are they not taking tests, for example? Now, if you look at essentially the sensitivity of the model to changes in the different underlying factors, unfortunately, uh, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but it turns out that in that early Omicron spread period, um, it's actually pretty boring. Almost everything is explained by having data zones with typically a lower age range and also with higher populations with a little bit of effect from things like uh, when the outbreak started in the data zone, household size, um, and the number of students in the area. I just remind you that part of the reason why that is is because in that period for cases, um, things are spread out relatively evenly. Um, further analysis ongoing with regards to looking at more severe outcomes and the later phases of the epidemic. Okay. So um, that's pretty much puts us where we are. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes because I was asked to do this by uh, Mel Gyarshi, who's we've been working with in the Scottish government, just some thoughts on, on what it's been like working with them. Okay. Um, I wanted to put this in about the media. So like many, many others, I've been spending a reasonable amount of time trying to do a bit of public engagement. Um, and I'm one among many, and there's many others who are much more prominent than I, I have been in doing this. Um, I got started in it because I wanted to do something to help when in fact we weren't modeling uh, things. Um, but I've really understood since then that it's really important to get out there and try to help people to understand more about the underlying science. There's plenty of people who are spreading dissemination of, of bad information, trying to spread information well, getting it from a diversity of voices is important. And if you're interested in doing this, I really would encourage you to do that. Maybe not for COVID-19 now, or you know, it's, certainly there's still time to do so, but even if it's not that in other areas of your research, and the Science Media Center in particular is really, really uh, useful in trying to get people uh, to better training and get you engaged with, with uh, the media, okay? And it is really rewarding. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's not. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been working with the Scottish government to provide medium-term projections 
analyze vaccine uptake and look at spatial analysis. Um, I'm also going to mention that I've been involved with SPIAM, so the, the modeling uh, group that advises SAGE, who meet regularly. And I'm going to mention this because um, I have a slightly unique perspective and I came to it relatively late and was able to see just how much work was being done. So we've contributed a little bit, others have contributed much, much more. And I think seeing it in that relatively late stage has maybe given me a different perspective. And one of the things that was very clear is just how much um, camaraderie and useful debate goes on in that context. So this is debate of, of a form that which aims to help to understand to make things better. I think that's absolutely critically important. Um, and the points I want to make here is one that are, um, David and Graham already made. First of all, simpler is often better. Okay, situations change very rapidly. And when they do, simpler models can often give you enough of a handle on things when, um, when you need responses fast. The second one is related to the point before, which is that consensus matters, okay? So a single model could be right almost all the time, but the time you worry about is when it's wrong, and then you need alternatives to try to understand things. And the last point I wanna make is, um, and I knew this before, and I think a lot of you already do, just because you were wrong doesn't mean that you made the wrong decision at the time okay so decisions based on evidence at any given time um are often wrong and so there are many many examples when being wrong is viewed as an example of of not being useful and this is really a different version i guess uh, of some of the things were said before you know it's not that important that you're right. It's important that you understand the data and the situation you have at the time to help decisions. Um, some key questions for the future. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is the reinfection rate, because this is going to be absolutely crucial as we go forward, because so much of the population has already been infected with COVID. Um, and how that reinfection rate changes depending on vaccination past will go a long way to determine what future ways may look like. Okay, It's related to the question of how different strains compete in space and time. You've already seen some things on this. Um, a critical thing is what drives variant emergence and whether or not that's going to change as we move far, farther away from not just here but elsewhere being under conditions of lockdown as things start moving around in space more like things like flu. Um, really important to know what's going to happen in a normal winter. And I'm also interested in this last question, which is consensus modeling is a very interesting thing in and out of itself. And I think there could be a lot done more in that area. Uh, I'm just going to mention very briefly, um, I have a job open for anybody who's interested in putting together some of these modeling approaches together with viral sequence data. Uh, the closing date is April 4th, so please do pass it around to others. And the last slide, of course, is acknowledgments all the people who've contributed to this, the one with the stars doing the most work contributing to this direct talk, but a lot of work and a lot of advice from others. And of course, the funders are in the bottom left. And uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. And that was really, uh, really interesting and, and slightly, well, different perspectives to, to some of the other talks. I was just thinking it's um, interesting to see the route that everybody that's spoken today, the different routes that they've come from to be developing the models. So yeah, really interesting. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat, but I think um, Ewan um, has responded, your colleague Ewan has responded to those. So I believe those have been answered, um, posted some further details. Um, so thank you for raising those questions. Um, if anybody else has got a question, then please do post it. Um, if not, then um, we've, we'll be uh, reconvening tomorrow and I'm, I'm not sure which of the speakers will be able to be with us tomorrow, but there will be another chance to uh, to send questions on. And again, if you happen to think of something after the event um, and you want us, well, you've probably got everybody's contact details, but we can obviously facilitate sharing any questions with us with the speakers if you if you aren't aware of their details. Um, so I think um, that's all, all for now, just to thank all of the speakers very much for joining us and, and obviously all of the attendees um, to say that we'll reconvene at 13.30 uh, tomorrow. We'll, we'll open the Zoom room at sort of 25 past 1, 25, yeah, 13.25. Um, and we've got a different set of talks tomorrow. So thank you very much and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Thanks, Claire.